here, and I appreciate you coming and being here in the service tonight. Trust the Lord will uh, help us and move us closer to Himself. Seems like lately in the meetings that uh, the Lord has allowed me to preach. I've, I've been very, very busy this whole year. Only had one uh, week off since the first of the year. But it uh, seems like the Lord has really been burdening my heart uh, about trying to get back to Him, moving to Him. Uh, we've, we've got a sense of our waywardness and understand that He desires that we draw close to Him. And I believe the Lord uh, has never pushed anybody away that's had a real desire to want to get close to Him. And I believe that. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 5, if you will, please. Mark chapter 5, very familiar portion of the Word of God. And uh, this, this particular chapter has been entitled by some as the biblical hospital. And you find in the first portion of the chapter, the men's uh, ward. And then where the Lord heals that, that uh, Gadarian maniac. And there we find he's, he's master over demons. And then you find him with the woman with the issue of blood. And that, of course, that'd be the women's ward. And there you find he's master over disease. Then to the end of the chapter, he raises Jairus' daughter. There's the children's ward. And then uh, there he's the master over death. And I'm glad that uh, in this chapter we find that there's not anything that he cannot conquer. What a great God he is. And uh, what, he, what he did then, he still has the ability to do today. I want to read a very familiar portion of Scripture, and uh, we'll discuss it and look at it tonight. Verse number 21, beginning in Mark chapter 5. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse when she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself, that virtue had gone out of him, turned himself about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole 
of thy plague. I leave off reading there tonight and I want to preach on this subject. Touching Jesus is all that really matters. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, as you've assigned us to this portion of the Word of God tonight, I thank you, Lord, for the account and the occasion here of this woman who was in real need of help from the Lord. I pray that you would allow us to take this scripture and, Lord, make it a practical application in the lives of we that are here tonight. I pray now, Lord, that your will would be accomplished. Thank you for what you did in our midst this morning. We're asking, God, that you would continue to further us uh, in your will as the week progresses. And I pray that we can get to that distance that you want to carry us to. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, we should be in hell tonight, but we're not. Thank you for the marvelous grace of our God that gives us what we don't deserve. I pray now that your will be done and we'll thank you for what's accomplished. Deal in the hearts of the unsaved. Touch those that enter a wayward condition. And for whatever is accomplished, you'll receive the glory for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now I'm going to say on the outset that touching Jesus is all that really mattered in the life of this woman. Nothing else was feasible. Nothing else needed to be accomplished. She needed to get to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to say that's the ultimate need of the church in this hour is getting to the Lord and touching Him and receiving from Him at what He has for you and I. As I begin to look at this and I made reference to it this morning that there are those in the Scripture that the Lord went to and touched. I believe that those are those that did not have the ability to get to him. I thought about the three uh, folk that were dead in the New Testament that the Lord touched, uh, and he made his way to each one of them. The reason he did is that they could not get to him. That certainly is a picture of the resurrection power of Christ that he does in the hearts of the unsaved. I want to say in my sinful condition, in my unsaved condition, I could not get to where he was. I was dead in trespasses and sins, but I'm glad that he came to where we were. Aren't you glad of that? I've made reference many times before and probably hear that the only way you can get into heaven is to enter in through the door. And the door, it, if it had have stayed in heaven, nobody here could have ever went. But I'm glad God unhinged the door from there and sent him to this low land of sorrow. And Jesus said, I am the door. And he hinged him on an old rugged cross. And everyone that enters in gets to go there. What does that mean? That means he came to where we were. And I'm glad he was made like you and I. So we see there were those in his earthly ministry that he made his way to and touched. But I want to say on the other hand, there are those that God helped that he did not go to them, but they made their way to him. I thought about the Syrophoenician woman. I'm glad that she came for the sinfulness of her daughter. Can I tell you, we can still do that. 
I'm glad we can come to him in behalf of someone else and touch him in behalf of someone else. But then here is probably the most familiar one who touched him, and that's the woman with the issue of blood. Matter of fact, Luke chapter 6 and verse 19 says, And multitudes sought to touch the hem of his garment, and everyone that touched was made whole. I want to say, friend, that there was multitudes that touched him in those days, but this is the most familiar one. He goes into detail. Let me say that if you have the ability, if you've already been touched by him in salvation, I'm glad that we can get to him and be touched in sanctification. If you've been touched in resurrection, I'm glad that we can touch him for revival. Amen. We need to get to where he is. I think we're waiting on God to move on us and he's waiting on us to move toward him. And we're at a deadlock. But if we can let this woman be our example tonight, I think it'll be greatly beneficial to us. Now, let me say that somebody said, well, preacher, we can't touch him in this hour. Oh, but the Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I'm telling you, though I may not be able to reach and touch him, physically as this woman did. I'm glad us have the same ability through the channel and avenue of prayer and the power of the Holy Ghost to touch him and in touching him we can get what we need to help us in our crippling condition. Amen. Hallelujah. Now three minor things I want to mention. Very elementary. First of all I want us to look at this woman. Let me say that it is a woman. And I think that the Holy Ghost is wanting us to know that uh, this is a, a female. And the church is the bride of Christ. And let me say to you that the church, one of these days, she's going to be perfect. Hallelujah. But oh, until we get there, we sure do need help for the condition that we're in. Let me say that this woman, I believe, as we look at her tonight, we can type her as the church, and the church needs to get back to him. Notice her problem. Very elementary, this woman's got a problem. Now, this problem was draining away her very life's ability. In other words, if she doesn't get help soon, she's going to cease to exist. I preached last week at a church and I told them that if, if, if a church doesn't get help from God, they are not self-sufficient. The church, it does not have the ability to sustain itself. It's got to have help from the head. And that's the God of heaven. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is not self-sufficient. I believe that it is indigenous. I believe she ought to be an independent work. But if she ever gets independent from God, she'll cease to exist. Oh, we do not have the ability to keep, keep going in the power of our Self. Our power is running out and we need help from Him. Amen. Praise God. I believe this is going to work tonight. I really do. Listen to me carefully. Her problem was draining away her very life. If she doesn't get help soon, she's going to cease to exist. Let me see. In her problem, listen carefully now, the cost involved. Notice in the text. Did you know there's a great cost involved to keep on dying? 
Didn't cost her anything to get help. Cost her everything to keep getting worse. I want you to get a hold of that. You see, there's a cost involved. Look, if you will, in verse 26. This woman had suffered many things. Of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. The worse she got, the more it cost her. And eventually she ran out of resources. And the only thing that matters now is getting to the Lord Jesus. Oh, hear me, church. I want you to know that dying will cost you everything. It'll cost you the presence of God. It'll cost us our families. It'll cost us our children. It'll cost their influence in the community. Dying. You lose everything. It'll cost you everything to die. It don't cost you anything to just get to him and touch him. He didn't charge her a dime. Those other doctors drain her of all of her resources. But Jesus never charged her a thing. I'm glad his services are free. To, it wasn't to him, but they're free to us. It's amazing that we keep getting worse and the ability to get better is so close by. I dare say that if we had some kind of terminal disease and we knew there was a, there was a physician somewhere close, why you would and you and and he had the ability to heal you and you and he knew you knew that he could. Why, my friend, you would give everything you've got to prolong your life a little longer. But here the church is dying. Now I'm not fussing; I'm only preaching. I preach all over this country. I'm telling you, the church is dying. As a whole, the church is dying. We're living in that great falling away. We're living in a mess, but you don't have to die, church. Why? Because Jesus is still near at hand. And if we can get to him and touch him, we can receive what we stand in need of. Amen. 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 I see the cost involved. First thing, she lost her health. She got to looking peaked. Churches around the country now are looking that way. She not only lost her health, she lost her wealth. She lost everything. She, she didn't get better. She spent, now get the wording, she spent all she had. Didn't say she spent just all of the money she had. I believe the money was what probably depleted first. I believe she probably spent every dime she had but I got to meditating on this, Brother Harold. I wouldn't doubt if she didn't have in her possession some very precious things, maybe some jewels or some things that had been passed down from generation to generation that had become very precious and, and very expensive. I wouldn't doubt if she didn't search through the house those things that, she, that had been passed down to her, she now sells off for little or nothing to try to get enough money to make another doctor's appointment so that she could get better. I'm telling you, friend, I'm finding churches in this hour selling off a lot of those precious things that's been passed down from, from, from generation from our forefathers that really believe God. I still believe where the Bible says we need to seek out the old past and when we find them, stand and walk therein. I'm telling you, friend, the new way just ain't working. But I'm glad God's way will always Word. And I, I don't believe we need to sell off what's been precious to us just to try to get better because you're not going to get better. You're going to get worse and worse. Oh, we're, I've done mention it, but we're selling off those precious things and losing our children, losing our homes, losing our communities. Do you know? Is, that, is the bank still down the road here? Is there a bank? There used to be a bank right down here. This might be the building. Is in, I don't know. 
next door it's gone. But I can tell you this. This church right here is more important than that bank used to be in the community. Somebody said, oh, we've got to have a bank. No, you've got to have a church. I'm telling you, a church is the greatest need of any community. And not a dead church, a church that knows what God's all about and the power of God and the touch of God. And if we lose that, we lose our need to exist. Amen. I see the cost involved. I see the consequences revolve. What do you mean, preacher? Well, I can see it in my mind's eye now. As she goes and makes another appointment with the new doctor that comes in, and uh, she pays him what she's got, expecting to be better in the morning. You know she wouldn't have spent all she had if she wasn't expecting to get better. She's intending to get better. And she goes and she makes an appointment. She tries this new thing. And she gets up in the morning worse than she was yesterday. Because the Bible said she nothing she got she was nothing bettered. There wasn't one minute in her twelve years of sickness that she got better. Every day she got a little worse than she was the day before. Oh, I want to tell you, friend, there is no way to better ourselves outside of getting to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to get to Him. Our plans and programs, just, I'm not, I'm not against plans and programs. I believe God does things decently and in order. But if you try to program it without God, it'll end up in a complete mess and we'll get worse and worse. We need God to help us. Amen. We've got got to have God. Praise God, I love it. Oh, listen. The consequences revolve. She intends to, I've seen churches, I've watched them. Over the years, they hear about another church that's seemingly really booming and growing, and they adopt their mannerisms. And instead of helping them, it makes them worse. You see, only, let me say this, only God's church is helped by God. Every other church can grow without God. But it's not a church. I need to rephrase that. Every other congregation can grow without God, but the true church can't. It'll dwindle away to nothing unless God gets back in the midst. You know that everything that gets bigger... Everything that grows is not a good growth. That is right. You can kill an old dog and after it's dead, it'll grow. It'll get bigger. You can run over a dog and mash it flat and then go back a week later and it's bigger than it was when you killed it. Why? It's a getting bigger. There's a lot of places that getting bigger, but it ain't a healthy growth. And when it does explode, it stirs up a stink, I can tell you that. Let me say that, let me say it again. Please get this. Everything that's getting bigger doesn't mean it's a nutritional growth. There's some things that's swelling by infection instead of growing by nutrition. (laughs) It's better to have a church. I'd rather have slow growth as a swelling. I wasn't going to say that, but I'm here in Ash Wells too. I would rather have a very slow growth and it be right as I would for something to swell up overnight. You can be assured that if it swells overnight, it's infection. That's right. Well, let's move right along. We see there's the cost involved, the consequences revolve. And then the conclusion resolved. You know what this woman did? She came to one conclusion. Listen, she didn't come to two ideas. She's had a dozen ideas before. But she's narrowed them all down to one. I've got to get to Jesus. 
she, she resolves to one conclusion. I've got to get to Jesus. Would you get that? She didn't say, now, I'm going to try this in Jesus. Or I'm going to keep doing this and then Jesus. No. She came to one conclusion. I've got to get to him. And if I can just touch, boy, I appreciate y'all singing that this morning. If I could just but touch the hem of his garment, I believe I can be all right. Wonder what made her do that. She's probably heard somebody else that was in trouble. And they got to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. And now they've told her, I tried everything too, and it didn't work. But there's a man called Jesus. Never met nobody like him. And if you can ever get to him, if you can ever get close enough to him to touch him, you're going to get what you need. Amen. I believe that she came to that conclusion. She dropped every other idea and said, I've got to get to him. Church, listen to me carefully. I'm not saying we need to quit everything. No. Need to keep doing what we're doing. But let's get to Jesus to get help to do it. How long do you think she could have worked in her condition? Well, she'd probably quit working. Because she's getting too weak to do so. See, touching Jesus fixed everything. My goodness. We see her problem. Let me say secondly, and I appreciate this about her, I see her persistence. Now, I wouldn't doubt by her from some of her friends, closest friends probably, she was encouraged to quit trying. After 12 years and now she's broke, there's probably a crowd was waiting on some kind of inheritance and now it's gone. How do you know she was rich? If it took 12 years for the doctor to drain her, she was rich. And it took 12 years to deplete everything she had. She was a wealthy lady in the beginning, but now she's broke. I'd say everybody now has said to her, you just as well as to give up trying. You just as well as to leave it alone. You've tried everything you know to try. You just as well as to go ahead and sign the papers that you are going to end up just like this. You're not going to get better. Has the devil ever convinced you that we're living in the last days now and we just wells to settle down and coast on in home just like we are because the Bible's being fulfilled and we're supposed to die? Oh, no, buddy. You'll not ever get me to believe that. There may be a great falling away and there may be those that getting cold and indifferent, but we don't have to. There's a same God in heaven that'll, that'll help us that's helped everybody that's ever come to him before. Amen. I want to tell you, God's still on the throne. He's still on the throne. I see her persistence in her persistence I see her determination. This woman is determined that she's going to get to the Lord. The Lord pointed this out to me here. In Matthew chapter 9 gives us the same account of this woman. The Bible says in verse 21, here's what she said. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. You know what she said? She's saying, I'm determined to get to him whether anybody else does or not. She didn't send out a plea. She didn't say to her husband if she had one. She didn't say to her children if she had any, if we could all get together as a group and touch the Lord, then I believe it. No, no. She made up her own mind. If no one goes, I'm going. 
If no one is going, I'm going. Praise God. There's a multitude that needs help, but she said, if I can get to him, I believe I can get help. You'll have to make up your own mind personally whether anybody goes to touch him or not. You're going to. And you know something? He was on his way to help Jairus' daughter, but he stopped. When she touched him, he stopped. You know what that lets me know? Anybody else that was around could have touched him too. If one person will touch him, he'll hang around a while. Oh, oh, I'm telling you, somebody needs a purpose in the heart. You know, a lot of times we say, well, if if I get my husband to do or my children, or there's no way I can touch him and do what I'm doing. That's exactly right. We got a purpose in our own minds that we're going to touch him. I hope I'm pleading with one heart tonight. Boy, it'd be good if it'd be a half a dozen or a dozen purpose, but I'm pleading with one. If one will touch him, it'll eventually help everybody. (laughs) I see her determination. I want you to get this. I also see her desperation. You know, normally, we don't ever purpose to get to him until we're made to do so. Boy, every time I preach this, the Holy Ghost nails me right there. Normally, when everything's smooth sailing, We just kind of float along with the rest of it. But if tragedy hits, it makes us desperate to get to him. I want you to listen to this right here. I wonder if we could become desperate without being made desperate. I wonder if we could get to him and touch him without being made to if it could save a lot of these problems that make us. See, God arranges situations in our lives to keep us from getting too far away from Him. I wonder if we'd purpose to stay close if we couldn't save a lot of this, these problems. If we could become desperate, let me, let me re-emphasize this. If we could become desperate without being made desperate, It'd be much better on us and our children. I wish the Lord could make some of us desperate without being made desperate. (laughs) Oh, my Lord. I believe God would fix a lot of our problems that we're having if we just submit our all to Him. Now, Amen. a lot of times God don't fix what we're praying for because He's wanting to fix us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And He won't fix what's got us on our knees till we get fixed. Amen. He's not going to fix it till we get fixed. Because that's, that's the only thing that's keeping us on our knees is our problems. Oh, Lord, there's no way that I can stay in a far country with my problem that's got me on my knees if I don't come home first. He will not fix my problem as long as I'm the problem. He's... He's arranged this situation to keep me on my knees. And as long as I'm on my knees... With my problem, I can't get no further away than what I am. I've never saw this like this till right here. But if, if I will say, oh God, I, it's not my problem I need you to fix, it's me. Lord, if you can fix me, Lord, help me. This situation I've been praying for, Lord, if it wasn't for that, I'd be further away than what I am now. God, would you fix me? And when God fixes us, He may take care of the problem. You see, 
her. She is desperate. Uh, I want you to look at this here with me back in Mark 5. I'm just about done. Notice right here, please. Bible said in verse 24, Jesus went with him and much people followed him and notice the wording, thronged him. Now there's a whole crowd around him. Matter of fact, when the woman touched him, down in verse number 30, Jesus said, who touched me? Now he knew who it was. Jesus never asked questions to get answers. Man that knows everything don't have to ask no questions. Who touched me? The reason he asked that question is for her to come forth. But watch this. He said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said, thou seest the multitude, there's the word again, thronging thee, and you want to know who touched you? You know what the disciples are saying? My goodness, Lord. Look at all of this crowd. Well, there's no telling how many has bumped into you. Now, you can bump into him and not get any help at all. But he's not wanting us to throng him. He's wanting somebody to touch him. There's no telling how many bumped into him that needed help that didn't get it. But there's a difference in elbows and fingertips. See, you can bump into him, not meaning to, but you can't reach out and touch him without it being intentional. Amen. 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 So many times we're rubbing shoulders and bumping elbows and getting, fur- and getting colder and colder. But if somebody, somebody said, well, I'm a walking with him, oh, you can walk with him and bump into him and get cold in heart. But if somebody will touch him, that no... Everybody that bumped into him, nobody stopped him until the lady touched him and then he stopped. Praise God. I'm telling you, hey, there's a multitude. The church is thronging him. But somebody somebody in the multitude needs to touch him. Right? I I see her determination. I see her desperation. I see her declaration. Faith involved. Facts involved. She said by faith, if I can touch him, the fact is I will be made whole. (laughs) Notice something. When she touched him, he didn't catch what she had. But she sure got what he had. Because the Bible said that virtue went out of him into her. Amen. You know what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1? Those seven things that we're to add to faith. Add to your faith. You know what the first one is? Virtue. Verse number 5, 2 Peter 1. What, what we're supposed to do, the first thing you're supposed to add is virtue. You know what that tells me? You can't add nothing else till virtue's added. Right. And, that, and virtue is what you get from touching him. Amen. Boy, we've got to get to it. No other choice. We don't have no other choice. I, hey, we could preach a month's revival. And God move on us. But if somebody didn't touch us, it would end up as none avail. Amen. Somebody, said, somebody said, preacher, what's the most important thing in this revival? I can promise you it ain't me preaching. It's some saying to God, pressing to him to touch him. That's what's going to bring it. That's what's going to bring help. That's what's going to bring healing. It's touching him. Is that not right? Let me give you the last thing. I see her problem, her persistence, but then I see his provision. What was it, preacher? Well, 
He provided the garment. She said, if I can but touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad he's had on the right clothes to touch. Boy, that's another message in itself, but he's got on the right garments tonight. John saw, did you know when they crucified him, he, he hung there naked. But you know the last garment that he had on before they crucified him was that inner garment. And they gambled, they divided those other four garments. He had five pieces of garment. They gambled for those f four pieces, but then, no, they divided the four pieces, but then they gambled for that inner robe because it was woven without seam. See, Jesus had those garments on, but on the inside, next to the body, he had on pure linen. Because you see, pure linen... Pure linen is what they wrapped the Lord Jesus in when they buried him. You know what the high priest had on on the Day of Atonement? You know we heard, we've heard this, and I might have dealt with this, but we've heard this, that on the bottom of that high priest garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, and it was. And they say, history says, or they say, somebody said it, that they had to tie a rope around his leg when he went in to the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, the only thing wrong with that, he didn't have that garment on right. when he went in to the holy place. The right. Bible says in Leviticus 16, verse 4, that on the Day of Atonement, he took off his high priestly garment, put on a linen mitre, a linen vesture, linen breeches. Right. When the high priest went behind the veil, he had on pure linen, nothing else. And I'm sure that it had the blood of that innocent animal somewhere on it. The Bible says in verse 23 of Leviticus 16 that when the high priest came out to put his high priest garments back on to go out before the people that he left the linen garments there. Boy, what a picture. The Lord Jesus yonder on Calvary they took him down, Joseph of Amethy and Nicodemus did, and wrapped him in linen. But when he came out, guess what? He left the linen clothes there, never to be worn again. Blood soaked in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, friend, he's got on the right garment now for us to touch. I thought about this. She said, if I could but touch the hem of his garment. Now, there's a lot of modern ideas about what that, that some say, well, that was that prayer shawl. Well, I wish you'd have put it in there if it was a prayer shawl. It was the hem of his garment. So I says, prayer shawl. Other, the other writer said, if I could touch some part of his clothes. This ain't a prayer shawl. It was the hem of his garment. And you got to get real low to do it. Oh boy. And listen to this. A hem, ladies, am I right? Is the last thing you do to a garment, put the hem in it. Is that the finished work? The hem is the finished work. She said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, we're saying, if we can but touch the finished work, we can be made whole. Amen. And I thought about this, a hem, whether it's a cuff or a hem, this is a hem. It's turned up. You can't hem something unless it's turned up. And Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, from the earth will draw all men unto me. But you can turn it up, but it won't stay up by itself. It's got to be pierced. Oh, it's got to be pierced. And I'm glad they pierced him while he was lifted up. But in doing so, it provided eternal thread of redemption for everyone that will believe. Isn't that wonderful? I see that he provided the garment. Then I want you to get this. He provided the grace. So 
Somebody said, Preacher, I don't see any grace here. Not looking close enough. Jairus has got Jesus going to his house. They're not just on a casual stroll. Jairus is appalling him. He's got just a few minutes to get home. His daughter's died. They're at a brisk pace. This woman didn't run up in front. She didn't come in from the side. She pressed through the multitude, through the crowd behind. Now this woman's weak. She's about gone. Twelve years she's been sick. This is her last attempt to get to him. She's about gone. How, 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 what are you saying? He knew she was coming. So somehow or another he slowed down and let her catch up. Because she caught him from behind. And touched his garment. <laughs> hey, me, me, me. You know what he'll do tonight? He'll slow down and let you touch him. He's no respecter of person. If you purpose to press toward him, he'll let you get to him. I love that. Boy, I love that. I love that. Listen to me, church. Listen to me tonight. In the, in the account of this woman touching Jesus was all that mattered. Can you see that? Nothing else mattered. Nothing else mattered. Touching Jesus is what mattered. Could I say tonight, that's the only thing that matters for New Hope Baptist Church? Somebody said, boy, I wish I knew how we could do better. Touch Jesus. Get to Him. This whole message is simply about persevering in prayer till you get to Him. Press through the crowd. Press through the carnality. Press through the casualness and get to him. It's the only thing that matters. Let's stand, please. Let's come to the music with a song, please.